Here I've got a nice identity between the inverse tangent and the complex logarithm. And so I want to point out here that this is the tangent evaluated at potentially a complex number, although it could be a real complex number. And this identity, I think, is first due to Jean Bernoulli, and this is from 1702. Okay, so let's maybe get to it, and we're going to go through maybe some details that I would generally skip, just to maybe like leave this as freestanding of a video as possible. So what I'd like to do is construct, like from scratch, the derivative of the arc tangent. And I don't really mean from scratch using the limit definition of the derivative. What I mean is we'll use implicit differentiation. So we're not going to go all the way down to the ground, but we will start a little bit more basic than we usually do. Okay, so I'm going to start by setting w equal to arctan of z. And just recalling that our goal now is to find dw dz, which would be the derivative of arctan. You know, I pointed out that that's how we're going to do this. So we'll do this by passing this to the tangent function. That means tan w is equal to z. Now we'll take the derivative of both sides of this with respect to z. So that'll give us secant squared w times dw dz on the left hand side. Keeping in mind the chain rule, w is a function of z. And then on the right hand side we'll just have 1. The derivative of z with respect to z is 1. So that gives us dw over dz is equal to 1 over secant squared of w but secant squared of w is the same thing as one plus tangent squared of w. So we'll use that Pythagorean identity to rewrite that. But then we know tangent of w is z, so that allows us to write this as one plus z squared. So if tan w is z, tan squared w is z squared. And now we've got this familiar derivative of the inverse tangent. Okay, so now that we've got that taken care of, we're going to construct this identity using an integral. So I'm going to start with arctan of z. Okay, but I know I can write that as the antiderivative of the derivative of arctan of z plus some constant. So you obviously get a constant of integration whenever doing this. Our kind of goal will be to show that constant of integration is zero at the end, but that'll be fairly easy to do. So this is like a result of the fundamental theorem of calculus part one or two, depending on what your textbook counts them as. Okay, but now using this over here, we see that that is the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus z squared dz, and then we've still got this plus a constant. Okay, next I can rewrite this as 1 over 1 plus i times z times 1 minus i times z dz plus a constant. So Generally, 1 plus z squared, if you're in the real numbers, will not factor because that's an irreducible quadratic. But over complex numbers, this factors nicely. In fact, all polynomials factor into linear factors over the complex numbers. That's because the complex numbers form something called an algebraically closed field. Okay, now we're going to do partial fraction decomposition on the integrand. So we're going to take this thing, 1 over 1 plus iz times 1 minus iz, and hopefully decompose it as a over 1 plus iz plus b over 1 minus iz, where we have to determine a and b. So let's see. From here, we can multiply by 1 plus z squared. Let's recall that that's this product in order to clear the denominators. And so we've got a polynomial equation instead of a rational function equation. So that's going to leave us with 1 on the left-hand side, 
And then we have a times one minus i z on the right hand side. So that's because this one plus i z cancels, we're left with the one minus i z. And then we have plus b times one minus i z. Sorry, that should be one plus i z. Okay, good. So let's see where we can go from here. We can extract our constant terms and our z terms. Like keeping in mind that constants and powers and first powers of z form a basis for linear type polynomials. Okay, so the constants on the right hand side are a plus b. Constants on the left hand side is one. Then the coefficients of z on the right hand side is minus i times a plus i times b and it's zero on the left hand side. Okay, but notice this tells us that a has to be equal to b just by maybe dividing an i out. We get minus a plus b is equal to zero. In other words, a is equal to b. But then rolling that through the first equation, we see that they are both equal to one half. So a equals b equals half. Okay, so let's take this data, this partial fraction decomposition, and kind of summarize all, everything we've got so far at the top of the next board. So our last calculations left us at the following spot. We've got the inverse tangent of z is equal to 1 half times the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus iz plus 1 over 1 minus iz dz plus some sort of constant. So we used partial fraction decomposition along with a couple of other things to get to this point. But now we're ready to take these antiderivatives, which actually is not too bad. So here we've got this is one half. Then the antiderivative of this guy will be equal to the logarithm of one plus i z. But that's not quite right. Notice if you take the derivative of the log, I want to point out that our log is base e, and even though we've got log, that's pretty standard when you're working with complex numbers. Well, you take this derivative, you send this thing to the denominator, but then you also have to multiply by i. That's by the chain rule. So that means to undo that action, we have to divide by i. So we've got 1 over i like that. The same kind of thing goes here, but we have to divide by minus i. That leaves us with minus 1 over i times log of 1 minus i z, then plus a constant in the end and all of that stuff is being multiplied by half. Okay, so let's see what we can do now. Now we've got one over two i. We can push those together using logarithm rules. If you're subtracting logarithms, it's the same thing as dividing. So we've got the log of one plus i z over one minus i z, and then plus a constant. And then finally, what we can do is bring this two into a one-half power here, but a one-half power is the same thing as the square root. So we've got one over i, the logarithm of the square root of one plus i z over one minus i z plus a constant. Now, we have to figure out what that constant is. And we can do that just by plugging in any value for z and simplifying both sides of this equation. So let's notice that if we set z equal to zero, we get arctan of zero, which is zero. We get the logarithm of one, which is zero, and then we get plus this constant. So that tells us that this constant is equal to zero. Okay, so that means we've proved this identity. And now I wanna watch this identity work in practice just for fun. So we just got done proving this identity, and now I just wanna check it at some other value to give an idea for how it works. So we know that the tangent of pi over four is one, so that means pi over four is the inverse tangent or the arctan of one. But that means it should also be equal to the logarithm with one plugged in for z in this big complicated thing. So that's one over i times the log of the square root of one plus i over one minus i. Okay, well let's simplify that just to make sure this makes sense. 
So I'll multiply the numerator and the denominator by one plus i, and that's all happening in the square root, and I'll do that so that I have a real number in the denominator instead of a complex number. That's gonna leave me with one over i, and then the logarithm of the square root of one plus i quantity squared in the numerator and two in the denominator. But notice this square root will kill this square right here. So we can scrub those out if we introduce a square root of two right here. So let's see what we've got. We've got one over i and then the log of one over root two plus i over root two. Okay, but let's recall that one over root two is the same thing as cosine of pi over two and pi sine of pi over two. So this is in fact cosine, I should have sent pi over four plus i sine pi over four. Okay, so I mean that's well known because cosine and sine are both square root of two over two or one over square root of two at pi over four. But now we can use Euler's formula put, to put these together into a complex exponential. This is e to the i pi over four. Okay, great. So let's put all this together. We've got one over i times the log of e to the i times pi over four. But now the logarithm and the exponential cancel each other and we have one over i times i pi over four but that gives us pi over four in the end. So obviously that was expected because we proved this identity was true, but I think this is a nice calculation just to check that everything works. And that's a good place to stop.